But I know people want to be better by and large. Occasionally when you're out there trading, you get people who really just don't care. And the temptation is to just say, well, screw it. You don't care about this. I don't care about you. We can't afford to do that. We have to help them understand why it's important. Now, at the end of the day, when they walk out of the classroom, they still may not give a damn about anything that we said, but it's not because we haven't tried. It's still a coaching relationship at some point. Okay, so welcome to the Electrical Safety Podcast. Today we have Stephen Hester as our guest. Stephen is the training director for Saver Power Services and has been teaching electrical safety for over 15 years. Today we'll be getting into his views and approach on electrical safety training as well as overall thoughts on the current state of electrical safety in the workplace. Uh, Stephen, uh, thanks for coming on the show. Hey, you're welcome. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's my pleasure. So usually I like to just get things started by, you know, getting a bit of background, uh, you know, how you got into the industry and then how you found your way into the electrical safety space. I always find that interesting uh, from our guests. So yeah, how'd you, how'd you get started in all this? Well, I, I like to say for the electrical safety space, it was purely accidental. Um, I, I started off in the military, so I, I retired. I started off in the Navy, retired from the Army, uh, which seemed like a, a rather weird career, but it actually tied in quite well because I started off in the Navy in submarines. I was a mechanic. So later on in the Army, I where I really got into the electrical side through uh, U.S. Army has this thing called the Prime Power Program. So a lot of people out there in the industry who are familiar with that. And uh, I was trained there too as a as a power plant mechanic and. Probably would rather be wrenching on a big, greasy diesel engine than anything else. And, and got in, got into the electrical side there. But when I, when I left the Army, really, I didn't have any real plans to go into training. I was going to do something you know, completely different. I was started off as a project manager, and then I had the opportunity later on. I decided I really like being a project manager, and I had the opportunity to go training. And it, it took me a few months to really decide if that's what I wanted to do. So I, I made the jump from project management into training. And at first I wasn't really sure that that was the, the, the career for me. And although I'm, you know, people tell me I'm good at it. So maybe there's some truth to that. I don't know, but, um, you know, eventually I just, I, I settled into the, I settled into the role and I, I settled into the idea that. Uh, teaching electrical safety, we can make a difference out there in the world. And to me, that's what it's all about. It was never, I mean, yeah, the money's nice, but it was never about that. It was always about just trying to make a difference uh, and you know, keep people, like keep people safe, keeping them from uh, hurting themselves, burning the place down. Yeah. Yeah. So was there, was there anything kind of in your military days um, that maybe would have sparked that interest? Or, or like, how did, you know, so you, you want to make a difference, but did you, did you come across something? Did you have an incident? Did you witness some stuff or did you just kind of, you know, get out in the world and had this opportunity? I just got out in the world, had this opportunity primarily. I mean, looking back on the, on my time in the, particularly in, in the army, I, I, I didn't realize at the time just how much I didn't know and how much we didn't know and how limited our worldview was in the pride power program. So, uh, looking back on the way that we approach things, not, not that we did things that were unsafe. There was just a lot of things that we did not know because we didn't have the access to information that we do now. And, and at, at first, like I said, when I got into this, uh, I wasn't really sure if that's where I wanted to be, but the more I learned about electrical safety training and the more I did it and the more I was out there talking to people in the industry and I saw what the needs were in the workplace, I, I realized that some of my early conceptions about electrical safety training were, were I don't want to say unfounded, but I assumed that one time that people knew a lot more about this than what I've learned that they do. Uh, I, I thought, yeah. okay, I'm just out here, I'm out here just regurgitating uh, regurgitating rules and telling people things they already know. And then I found out that really 
the guys in the workplace may have been out there for years and not heard some of this information. So was- well, that's something I'm always amazed at is, uh, and especially when you're in the electrical safety space mm-hmm. and you think about it every day, you, you almost seem like you would think that some of this is second nature. And, uh, you know, you, you, you introduce some of these concepts to people and it's, it blows their mind. And that always, you know, I can almost never believe that myself. Right. Um, well, that, a couple of weeks ago, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I, I was at a, a customer site and I was actually teaching a, a group of operators and I was talking about art flash labels and the information that was on there. And so they had a lot of questions. And what I learned from that discussion was nobody had ever explained that to them before. They've seen art flash labels in the workplace for years, but they never had been taught about what that information means and how to use it. So even at this point, I was... I like to say I'm not surprised by things, but I, I still get surprised. And that was one of them. It's like, wow, you know, nobody, how many other people out there in the workplace just don't know because they haven't been told or they, they've got misconceptions because what has been, what they've been told has never been thoroughly explained. Mm-hmm. And so they're out there operating on, half information or erroneous information. And that is, is, we're not new with the electrical safety business, but still we're, we're, we're not, we're not getting the information out there that we should. Yeah. I, you know, something I've seen and let me know if you maybe agree with this, um, with, with a lot of these companies, electrical safety seems like a very technical thing. So it's not given to the safety department so much as it's giving to maybe the electrical engineering department or the maintenance department. And then so when it comes down to training, you you end up with a very, like a very technical approach to it. And, but what you miss is that practical approach to it or that safety side. Like, how do you, how do you approach your safety courses and the training that you do? I, I approach it from a, from a practical perspective. When I'm out there, I, these, most of the people that I, I deal with, they, they know the rules. Uh, they can, you know, they, they've read the safety manual. They are somewhat familiar with the NFPA 70E and they, they've had rules based training for since day one. But what they haven't really been taught is how to put this information into practice. So they get told, Hey, you have to wear this PPE, but they're not necessarily they don't necessarily know why they have to wear it other than somebody told them that they have to, or they have to use, you know, X, Y, Z, uh, work practices to, to go out there and perform a given task. And they'll look at it and say, well, you know, I, I used to not have to do this. I didn't do it this way when I started. So why should I do this now? So they don't understand where these rules have come from and, and why why they need to to use those the way they do. So my approach is to say, okay, look, we know that electric shock, arc flash are potentially very bad things. And this, this, this is what it can do for you or do to you. And this is how you want to protect you. That's overly simplified, I know. But I try to make it as practical as I can so they can take the information. They don't have to sit there and go through the NFPA 70E and see what I'm talking about is something that they can take out into the plant and put into practice immediately. Mm-hmm. I hope anyway. Yeah. So I know when we spoke earlier, um, you kind of mentioned that, you know, was it maybe human performance or human behavior, something along those lines that you mm-hmm. have given a lot of thought to? Is that something you can kind of elaborate a bit on? Yeah, I, I like to talk about why we do some of the things that we do. I mean, we have rules, and you know, when you look at when, when you look at at, at errors, uh, you, you've got you got rule based errors, you got skill based errors, you got knowledge based errors. So all of these 
workers that I'm out there dealing with, whether they're operators or they're electricians or what have you, they've got some knowledge in all three areas. They know the rules for the most part. They've got some skills. They've got some knowledge. They don't always line up. So they may know, they get a lot of rules-based training, but they don't necessarily know how to implement that. Or they've got a lot of skills and knowledge that they've, they've gained through years of experience in the business, but they haven't kept up with the, the standards, the codes and standards now. So things that we used to look at, like work and energize, they, you know, I mean, obviously that, that practice has been discredited for the most part. They still don't see a problem with it. So they're like, mm -hmm. well, I used to do this all the time. Why is it, why, why is it a problem now? So I, I try to, um, let, let them see, okay. Um, you know, and when I explain, uh, rules-based skills-based knowledge-based errors, and I talk about things that they might do out there in the workplace that they would see as being perfectly normal, but how those things, particularly when multiple people are doing them, how all of that can align, and then we can set ourselves up for failure without even really thinking about what we're doing. So they think, all right, I'm, I'm cutting some corners here. I'm cutting some corners there. I'm saving time on the work. I'm getting more work done. Uh, I'm, I'm doing it better and faster and cheaper. But better and faster and cheaper do not always go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, speed and speed and speed and quality do not speed and quality and safety do not do do not equate there. So yeah, well, uh, there there's definitely a balance. Um, you know, you have to factor in safety, but then right. you know these companies you still need to make money, so you right. can't just shut everything down all the time forever exactly so you got to factor in well are we doing this in the most efficient manner you know maybe if you're a contractor too you have a client that you're doing work for and they don't quite understand what it is so you got to make sure you're you know you're uh uh keeping them happy just 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 for kind of people you know i've read a little bit about it skills based knowledge based rules based what are some examples of like errors that you would make in those three those three well, like a, a rules-based error might be stem from not understanding what the rules are uh, or just misapplying them so you you know that uh well if you look at at osha most frequently cited uh violations uh, control of hazardous energy is is a big one that we have here uh, in the states, and a lot of that stems from people just either not understanding how to do it, or yeah, sometimes when you get you get into um, well, I guess probably the simplest they they don't know how they they mm -hmm. they they they've never really been taught uh, how to do it, and so they they just they don't apply lockout tag out properly. Um, or they know what the rules are, but yeah, they just get lazy and they don't, they don't apply a lock where they need a lock. They just hang a tag on it or they'll, because nobody's watching, they'll not lotto it. They'll just turn it off. Figure, well, this job will only take a minute. So I don't really need to go through the, the lockout tag out process. And then of course, skill, a skill-based error occurs when they, they just do not have the, the technical skills uh, to do something. You've got somebody who might have to test for the absence of voltage, but he doesn't understand how to use a multimeter. Mm -hmm. Or he's, he's testing in a substation, but really doesn't understand how a, a high voltage, a proximity tester works. So he doesn't know if it's fibbing to him or not. Uh, where he's trying to test on shielded cable and thinks, okay, well, this is de-energized. Uh, and, and it really isn't. So there's a combination right. there too. Skills and knowledge kind of roll in together because they, they might have the knowledge they need, but they've never practiced it enough or they just don't have that technical skill and maybe they watched a YouTube video, but that doesn't get them really where they want to go. So, you know, it's really a challenge to get people to to look at themselves and, Make sure yeah. that make sure they're qualified. So 
you know, so, so they, they understand the relationship between the skills and the knowledge and, and following the rules. Right. So I think, you know, what I've seen is a lot of companies probably haven't focused on the three. They probably focus primarily on the rules and they mm -hmm. think people come factory installed with the skills and the knowledge. Right. Right. Well, every electrician out there obviously is qualified. Um, and we know that's not true, but because, well, you, you're a journeyman electrician. You must, you must have the skills to, to work with uh, 4160 switch gear or, well, the guy might have been, been wiring houses. Mm -hmm. And then he comes in, so you know, he understands safety rules, but he doesn't understand the equipment that he's working with or you you may have, and I've I've done this on on wind farms where I've been teaching uh, wind turbine technicians uh, medium and high voltage because they're going from a from a turbine into uh, medium and high voltage operations in a, in a, on a wind farm in a substation. So now they can't take that same skill set and that same knowledge that they needed for for turbine work and put that to work in a substation because they just, mm -hmm. they don't, they don't match. They don't line up. And you're right. Employers look at it and we spend a lot of time on the rules and say, this and do this, uh, do this, don't do that. If you do this, we'll fire you. If you don't do this, we'll fire you. But we don't really take the time to always teach them how to do that. Yeah. Well, here's a, here's an example that comes to mind for me. I remember, I can't remember where I heard this story from, but I remember the details. So it was a young, a younger kind of new employee to a company working the night shift as an ele electrical worker. Um, can't remember what the, what was going on in the plant, but for whatever reason, um, he found himself into the 13-8 switch gear and he called his, his foreman who was at home you know, in bed probably. Um, and the foreman said, oh yeah, well just go check the voltage on the switch gear and call me back. And I think he eventually called him back. It, it's not a fatality story, but it, he didn't call him back right away because what he went and did was he went and grabbed a thousand volt meter and tested the, the actual 13, eight KV switch gear. Now, what he didn't understand was that the, the foreman was saying, go look at the panel meter on the gear mm -hmm. right on the door. You don't even need to open anything up. Um, luckily, though, the young gentleman. Uh, so this would have came from his rules based training. There's a bag of PPE there. So he thinks, OK, I better put this PPE on before I I make this test. Now, the, the error he made, would, would that fall maybe in the knowledge, a knowledge error? So he he followed the rules. He put the PPE on. I guess technically he he had the skill to use a voltage detector, although he didn't he didn't use it on the right thing. Right. He put it on the wrong right. thing. Right. Exactly. That's where you get into a uh, a combination there. Skills and knowledge errors will overlap because you've got to have knowledge to execute the skills and you gotta have skills to execute the knowledge. So sometimes when we look at those, it's not always easy to see. We say, well. He, he was a journeyman electrician, so he should have known. Well, he might not have had the experience, pardon me, or he just may not have actually had the knowledge because he never gained it. Um, he, he never worked anywhere where he had to exercise those skills. Yeah. So I, I had a similar situation years ago with one of my, my, my wind farm customers where they had a technician who tried to ground a a 34, five KV bus that turned out to be energized. And he had been told that it was de-energized. Nobody had ever actually checked to ensure that it was. And when he went to apply the first phase, uh, apply the, mm -hmm. the first clamp to the, to, to a phase, he found out that it was still energized. So, uh, fortunately his injuries were minor. He did put on he did almost the proper PP. He didn't have all the proper PPE on, uh, but nobody ever checked. And he, he, so that would, that would 
indicate a, a, a rules-based error because they knew they knew they needed to check it, but they never did. And then he didn't use the proper PPE. So again, you know, another rules-based error because he knew what the procedure called for for PPE. And then as far as his, as far as the way he attempted to ground it, his grounding practices uh, outside of not testing were, were good. He attached the ground in first, went to apply the clamp to the first phase, and that's when he found out it was hot. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, a number of things had happened before that that should have prevented that incident from happening. Yeah, and, usually that's that's always true, right? There's right, a... and I tell people all the time, it's usually not one factor that contributes to an incident. It might be an isolated case where somebody just did not test for the absence of voltage and found out it was hot. But there had been, and when you look back at that incident, their entire isolation procedure uh, was incorrect. So they thought they had de-energized the, the feeder. They had not. Um, there were a lot of excuses as to why it was still energized. None of them were valid because nobody ever tested. And that was mm -hmm. the key. They, they knew that they should have, but they didn't do it. And then they made excuses as for why that didn't happen. So, yeah. uh, fortunately, you know, that was one of those cases where you know, no, no, nobody got hurt, uh, scared the hell out of everybody, but it could have, could have been a lot worse. Yeah. So I know a lot of people probably understand that they need to get training that might be called arc flash training or electrical safety training or NFPA 70E training. Mm -hmm. But what's some mm -hmm. of the stuff, you know, maybe you look at it as skills training or technical training, like what should most electrical workers be looking for? And, and not in the title of the course, but mm -hmm. actually the things like that, what are, what are the skills and in that, that they should be getting some training on? Well, when you look at the requirements for a qualified person, of course, it's pretty vague, but it says they have to uh, have received training in and demonstrated skills and knowledge in the construction and operation of their equipment. So when we're, we're mandating that, and that's in OSHA and the NFPA 70E, and when we're looking at the requirements for a normal operating condition, which among other things says the equipment must be properly installed, must be properly maintained. Well, how do we ensure that people know how to do that? So if we want technicians to understand if a circuit breaker is operational, if it's operating properly, the, what to look for in, in a circuit breaker or to look for in switch gear, then we need to actually go deeper into how that stuff works and teach them how to at least do some, some operator. And I say operators, I'm talking about shop floor level now, not like equipment operators, but teach them how to do some operator level maintenance. Uh, how did they do out? How do they go out and do an insulation resistance test? How do they do a contact resistance test? How do they verify periodically that this equipment does in fact work the way it's supposed to? without having to call a testing company out. I mean, we do that. We do electrical testing too. And we're, we'll certainly, we're certainly willing to help our clients. But what I tell them, particularly when I'm doing maintenance classes, is as part of their safety program. So they tell me, well, you know, we, we don't ever do this stuff. You guys come out and do it. Y'all have to know how to do it. Got to know that your equipment works. And then be able to, to tell us or tell somebody when it's not, and why you think it's not working properly, not just, well, it's broke, uh, which I get a lot of times. Uh, this mm -hmm. thing's broken. How do you know? It doesn't work. All right, great. But they, they've got to have the technical skills. So they've got to understand how their equipment is built, how it works, um, how to maintain it, how to do some minor servicing on it. We're not going to teach them how to overhaul the gear or you know, get real deep in the weeds on that, but they... they and again, in the skills and knowledge, that's where we're coming up short because we're not teaching people. And I say we, I'm talking about the industry as a whole. We're not teaching people what they know or need to know in order to ensure they're, they're, they're fully qualified. We're just assuming mm -hmm. that they know this. Right. So you take a generic arc flash electrical safety course, you learn the things that are mostly coming out of NFPA right. 70E, but nowhere in there does it tell you how to actually 
do any of the maintenance and no. technical work. No, I, I beat the drum on on maintenance and testing. I, I really do. I wear them out on that. And it's mm -hmm. not that I'm trying to teach them how to do it, but I, I talk about uh, safety-related maintenance practices. And I, I really hammer on the importance throughout the course. I'm talking about the, the necessity to properly maintain the equipment. And even with the operators, I'm talking about the importance of proper maintenance and how that can affect their safety if it doesn't happen and how they have to be able to recognize if a piece of equipment is perhaps not as functional as it needs to be. When the smoke's coming out of it, that's easy. But, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes when it misoperates, they don't really know why it's, it has misoperated. And then they might do something like the breaker, it, it fails to close or it trips. Okay, well, let me go reset it. But they have, they're not, it's, they're, they're not thinking about why it has tripped. Uh, and, and a good, a good example of this is an operator training that I was doing. Um, I, I was talking with operators about how to reset breakers. And I can't remember exactly what, what one of them said to me, but basically this is like a, a motor, a motor starter. And they said, well, they just tell us to, to hold the reset button down on the, on the bucket and then keep pushing the start button until it restarts. And I, I'm not going to repeat here on this podcast what I said, but my, my, my question was, why in the world, why would you do that? Uh, well, one of our, one of our electricians uh, told us to do that because they were tired of coming to reset it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's, that's automatically an abnormal operating condition. When something is, is, is tripping offline that frequently that you're tired of having to come reset it, there's a bigger problem there. Right. And teaching somebody bad habits, you're, you're, supply, you're applying a Band-Aid to that. And uh, you're, you're setting people up for failure. If nothing else, they can damage the equipment. They can damage themselves. Yeah, so one thing I noticed, uh, I guess you had an interesting quote on your LinkedIn page about your your attitude toward people. And I was just curious um, <laughs> how that... Depends on what day I wrote that. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, no, it's, 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 uh, it's right on your, on your main, your main page. Um, uh, if you don't, I can read it here for you. If you, uh, yeah, I probably remember. remember what that one is and I'm not looking at my LinkedIn page right <laughs> yeah, now. Yeah, so. just, uh, no, just about, uh, if we treat people as they are, we make them worse. If we treat people as the, they wish to be, we help them become what they are capable of becoming. And I was just curious as to maybe how you apply that into your kind of everyday approach with either people you're training or, or, um, or just, I guess, just, just in the office in general. Well, I know people want to be better by and large. Occasionally when you're out there training, you get people who really just don't care. Um, and the temptation is to just say, well, you know, screw it. You don't care. You don't care about this. I don't care about you. Um, we can't afford to do that. So, you know, they may not care, but we have to help them understand why it's important. Now, at the end of the day, when they walk out of the classroom, they still may not give a damn about anything that we said, but it's not because we haven't tried. It's not because we gave up on them. So this is a, whether it's, you know, if you're in the office dealing with people there, it's still a, it's still a coaching relationship at some point. Um, you're trying to help people become better. That's what that's what training is all about. It's not just mm -hmm. about going out there and parroting rules, reading the PowerPoints and giving them a quiz or showing them a bunch of videos for four hours. And and okay, Omni Domni, you you now know what you need to know. You you go out there and you show them that you can relate to them, that you know where they're coming from, you know what they're up against and how this information that you're giving them is going to help them be better and safer in their job, as well as making their workplace as a whole safer. That's another thing that I emphasize is take this information and apply it to your safety program, apply it to your workplace. 
and, and try to try to make it better. Not just because, okay, you're here because somebody said you had to be. Take this and put it to good use. And I, and I think if you treat people that way, um, I, by and large, you're going to be successful. Again, you're going to have some people who don't care. And I've, I've had those. And I've, I've been into plants where it seemed like nobody was interested in anything I had to say. You know what? I did what I needed to do anyway. And I, th I think you just, you have to treat people. And I, I treat them. I tell them when I come in, look, I, I'm, I'm a facilitator. Uh, this is a conversation that we're having. I'm not going to sit here and lecture you for four hours or eight hours or, or 16 hours. I'm not going to sit here and lecture you on electrical safety. I want it to be a conversation because I want to make sure that you're getting something out of this and that we're on the same page. And I think uh, anything else we're doing, we're, we're 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 doing our clients a, a disservice. We're doing the industry a disservice. The next question I wanted to ask you about was with with the current or the the most recent updates to NFPA seventy E. Um, was there anything that you found you know really jump jumped off the page for you as a major change? Something that's going to really impact people. Something they should know about. Well, what uh, one thing that I that I I, I preach and again I was just talking about this. Uh, when we're talking about resetting, resetting breakers, um, the, 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 the new requirement that the breaker be verified safe to operate, safe to reset by a qualified person. Because for a long time, what I've seen is you'll have equipment operators out there. They'll, the control room will call them. They'll just go reset the breaker without a second thought. Mm -hmm. And they don't necessarily know how a breaker really works. So mm -hmm. now... Hey guys, you've got to have an electrician. You've got to have somebody qualified come and, and at least help you to ensure that this device is safe to reset because it may not be, and you're not going to know that necessarily until, until something, until something goes sideways. So that, that's one of the ones that I, I really uh, impress upon, upon the operators. Uh, I wish I had, I wish I could say I've had a chance to, to go through every chapter and verse in the new 70 E I, I have not had a chance to do that yet. So, um, I'm, I'm kind of well, embarrassed I, to say that. I, I think, you, but... I think you touched on a good one though. Um, because you know, I know I can remember one place that I worked and I, and, and it was almost the electrician's methodology for troubleshooting was to turn the main breaker back on. Or, or turn off all the secondary breakers, turn the main back on and start turning things on until it tripped again. And then you'd find your fault. And so a lot of people probably don't realize, I guess, even maybe what the change was. And, you know, cause a lot of people, they believe that you can, oh, well, you can, you can reset things once and it's okay. And really what the change is, it's saying, no, that's not okay. Mm -hmm. You absolutely need to know why this tripped before you reset it is that right fair to say yeah because what happens and, and what i've seen out there is that uh you you have and this is not limited just to operators this includes electricians too that when a breaker trips their automatic assumption is that it's a nuisance trip and i've had i've had people tell me that well it's nuisance tripping how do you know it's nuisance mm -hmm. tripping well it's never tripped before okay well if we understand what a, a breaker is there for, why a fuse is there, if it, if it operates, there's a problem, or at least our assumption should be that there is a problem. Yeah. So when we talk about assumptions, and I talk about that a lot, uh, that's one of those, okay, am I going to assume there's a problem? Yes. That's a safe assumption. If I'm wrong, okay, good. But I verified that. If I assume there's no problem, then... I get proven incorrect by the equipment. That could be a significant issue. I may, mm -hmm. I may wind up just breaking the breaker and it doesn't work anymore, or I could let all the smoke out of something. And I've had that happen with clients before where they went to reset a breaker and it failed. Yeah. And, uh, no, I've so, seen that as well. Yeah. You know, I think we all have, uh, probably at some point and thank goodness it doesn't happen that often, but 
still, nobody wants to be standing in front of a a, a 480 volt airframe breaker uh, when that thing comes unglued. Mm -hmm. You know, even where the proper PPE, <laughs> that, that's that's going to hurt. Yeah, and then especially for you know we mentioned operators, and not to pick on them, but most of them would would probably never guess that maybe they should be wearing PPE. Oh, no, I've had that. operators tell me on numerous occasions that they do not uh, face electrical hazard. Right. Like, we're, we, we don't deal with electrical hazards. Yeah, you do. Mm -hmm. um, let's, let's talk about that. So you have a, a better appreciation for them. And how do you protect? And I'm not trying to scare them. Uh, but I want them to understand that there are electrical hazards present in the plant. And they need to do their due diligence, make sure they're operating equipment properly, make sure that they are wearing the proper PPE where it's required so that if something does happen, then they are properly protected. If it doesn't, then they take the stuff off and put it back in a locker and, you know, go about their way. Yeah. But they don't know how, they don't know to do that if they don't think there's a reason to. That's what I've seen as well. But, uh, so I guess at this point, Stephen, is there anything in particular that you've got that you're work, currently working on, or maybe it's just a soapbox that you like to get up on every once in a while? <laughs> I, uh, that, that might be a dangerous question. I can get on some yeah. soapboxes. Um, no, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm working on some, uh, I'm working on some presentations for, for different conferences coming up. Um, I've also got some, uh, some some research ideas of my own that I'm, I'm trying to flesh out because I'm trying to just look for ways that we can dig deeper into the, the, the topic of human error, uh, human mm -hmm. behavior, behavior-based safety, why things happen the way they do. Uh, so we get a better idea. Hopefully we get a better idea of why people have, why why do accidents happen? Is it is it because the operator didn't know? And I probably should have mentioned this earlier. There's another thing that I do talk about, and uh, you know, the, usually the maintenance guys like to hear it. Um, the, the the supervisors and managers don't because I talk about organizational errors, where where we we've got safety, uh, we got procedures that are not correct, we've got safety policies that are not correct. Uh, we're not buying people uh, proper updated PPE. We're not giving them the proper training. We're sometimes allowing them or requiring them to work more hours than we might otherwise deem to be prudent. So we're doing things out there in the interest of making money, of, of trying to be better and faster and cheaper, but really help contribute to problems at the at the worker level. So, yeah. You know, I'm real fond of saying that human error is a euphemism for we couldn't find anything else to blame it on. Right. <laughs> so yeah. uh, I, I found that, and I, I, but I, I'm quick to tell the guys in my class, like, look, that doesn't mean that you didn't make a mistake. Okay. You may very well have, and you've got to make sure that you're doing the right things the right way. But if you experience, say, a near miss, you've got to be honest with yourself about that. Uh, you might not tell anybody, but you know it was was a was a mistake. You know it was the wrong thing to do, and you've got to be honest with yourself. So self awareness is a big part of that safety that safety paradigm. We've got to make sure that yeah. people understand that we that we can screw up, and it's not always a bad thing. We're people, but if we don't learn from those mistakes, you know, we're, we're just gonna we're, we're just we're gonna make them again, and we might not get to walk away next time. Yeah. Well, I'm sure people would be interested to, uh, you know, kind of attend the conferences. You're, do you know where you're going to be speaking at next? Or? Well, the next one uh, will be in August. What's the date of that one? I don't remember. Uh, let's see. That's the uh, ASSP, American Society of Safety Professionals Region 3 Professional Development Conference. And that's going to be in Rogers, Arkansas in uh, late August, 28th through the 30th. Pardon me, 28th through the 30th of August. And I'll be presenting there. And uh, then hopefully, uh, let's see. Let's, 
I doubt it. I think I had more coming up, but um, you know, then then next year, of course, we'll make in the round of the uh, the the NETA uh, Power Test Conference, uh, yeah. American Clean Power Operations and Maintenance and Safety Conference, and uh, the ASSP conferences. So, I there's other ones out there. I'll try to I'll try to finagle my way into. Yeah. Yeah. What about like if somebody wanted to reach out, ask some questions, where's the best place to, to find Oh, absolutely. It? I'm always happy. Uh, LinkedIn is probably a, a good place to catch me because if, if you go right to my, my email, it might shut it off to junk or something like that. But yeah, my, uh, my LinkedIn profile is not always the best in the world about checking my messages, but that's a, that's a good place to, to catch me at. Perfect. Okay, well, thanks so much for coming on the show. We probably should uh, wrap it up here just to uh, keep it around the 40-minute mark, but it was a pleasure having you. Oh, I've and, enjoyed uh, it. It's uh, it's always a pleasure to come on uh, and do things like this um, because, you know, yeah, like I said, anything I think that we can do to, to get the message out there, to help people understand the need for, for working safely and to help them do that is, uh, you know, that, that's, that's, a, that's a value added to, to anywhere that they use electricity. And, you know, unless you're, uh, unless you're in a, in, in a South Texas outhouse, you, you got electricity somewhere. Oh, well said. Okay. <laughs> Thanks so much.